first off, I just appreciate everybody uh, coming out today and taking the time to uh, listen to this and get feedback on this. Uh, I've been involved in the solutions team on uh, in a couple of capacities over the last year, year and a half. Uh, the, the last several months in terms of leading the, the team to get this document out that we're now looking for feedback on. Keep in mind when we talk about the solutions, we're talking uh, the, the solutions efforts was really uh, run by those as many as over a hundred people that were involved in the solutions team, or about a dozen, dozen and a half actual uh, uh, primary members. But then in terms of the sub teams, uh, there's over a hundred people that are involved in the solutions over the last year, year and a half, working very hard. Now I think really what it's, it is is trying to get feedback from others. Uh, in terms of where did we get it right, where do we need to still do more work on it. So I think it's very important for the discussions today. Keep in mind when we talk about solutions um, on, on issues such as water, like the face here in, in Central Florida, that uh, while we have a solutions document, keep in mind that these issues did not develop overnight and we're not going to solve them overnight. These are, these are issues there that we have to be in for the long run. And continue to work on that as we go forward. Also, keep keep a perspective that uh, those things that we've got laid out in the document today, uh, ten years, five years from now, ten years from now, there may be factors that will change that will cause us to adapt. Um, it, it's it, it, it's just a, it's a plan that lays out uh, a schedule and going forward, and then we'll have to continue to monitor that as we go forward and adapt as as we need to. So uh, what I'd like to do is to review with you uh, the document. Again, I think uh, it's, it should have brought up earlier, but it's very familiar with the, the region, of the Central Florida region, in terms of the counties, Polk, Osceola, Orange, Seminole, <coughs> part of Lake Counties in Central Florida um, that, that this region covers. You go to the next slide. If you, if you look at the, uh, the region, we've got about 20 years ago, we had about 2 million people that, that, that resided in this uh, region. Uh, today, we've got around 3 million, and the projections are as many as 4 million there in another 20 years. Uh, our water use on the last 10 years or so has been averaging about 800 million gallons per day. 90% of that comes from groundwater within the region uh, from the aquifer system. And next slide. And then the, we're, we're very fortunate that Florida has a very productive aquifer system that allows us to withdraw. Uh, that is a resource. Everybody can overuse it. Uh, and when we do overuse the water from the aquifer, when we're, when we're withdrawing too much, it can have effect on the wetlands. It can have effect on spring flows. It can have effect on lake levels. It can have effect on, on rivers. And keep in mind that uh, these same systems are not only influenced by withdrawals from the ground. Uh, most of you know there that these systems are very much influenced by how much rainfall you get. Uh, you see dramatic swings in those uh, when you get uh, a, a tropical system come, uh, come by. Uh, they're also affected by the development activities that we, that we have done over the years. Years ago we, we thought there was too much water on the land and so we run ditches through the systems and drain the land uh, for, for a number of different reasons. And that has an effect. We develop the land and pave around it. That can have an effect on these systems. So it's a challenge for us as scientists to go in there and figure out how, how much is the system being affected by those withdrawals and how much is it being affected by other factors to make sure that we're not trying to solve a problem that's being caused by something else. The next slide. And again, the way the aquifer system works is, is when you're withdrawing groundwater out of the, the floor, uh, the, primarily the, the source of the aquifer that we utilize here is the upper Florida aquifer. And when you withdraw water out of the upper Florida aquifer, it tries to recharge itself, and so it will get water from either below or it will get water from the sufficient. If it's taken water from the sufficient, then that may take water from the lakes and the wetlands, uh, those systems there that we see. And so again, that's how it works. Uh, keep in mind there that if you have a, if you got two lakes that are nearby and you see one there that, that you're looking it's it's fluctuating more and you may wonder is it being is it being affected the same way uh, as a lake uh, very nearby and it, in many cases it's not so sometimes you can have a system there that's being affected by groundwater withdrawals and you go almost to the next door neighbor lake and it's not being affected by the same amount so these are some of the challenges we have as scientists in terms of 
assessing that and then also communicating that out with the public and, and the stakeholder down in the region. Next one. So what is CFWI? It's, it's a collaborative regional water supply effort to protect, conserve, and restore the water resource. And I think the two key words here are collaborative and regional. Uh, the collaborative part is, is that, again, this is a, an effort there that requires us to work very closely uh, with all the stakeholders in there, whether it's public supply, agriculture, industry, and the business community, and the general public. We've got to work with all those stakeholders. We've got to have all those stakeholders engaged in the process to help us identify and implement the best solutions for the region. I uh, can't stress that enough on how important that is for us to have a successful plan and a successful implementation of that plan as we go forward. And, and I want to underscore that. I've done a lot of work in this region on efforts to bring communities together. Without a doubt, this is a national best practice model on bringing um, stakeholders together to solve issues that are really critical for the long-term future of our region. And the, the um, water management districts and DEP should be really commended. Even if we disagree with particulars, the effort that's been put into this, nobody told them they had to do. This was based on what was best for our region. So I just want us to just take a moment and say thank you for the leadership of the three water management districts and DEP. Have a little, little round of applause. Principles. Uh, the steering committee for the CFWI, which involves the water management district, DEP, DAX, um, and the utilities uh, that have been uh, instrumental in this, identified three guiding principles. Um, and really, you can look at those as kind of the goals. The first one is, is to identify how much groundwater, the sustainable groundwater that's available. That we completed about two years ago. We spent a great deal of time, and it's, it's an easy question, it's a harder uh, aspect to answer. And the reason being is, is that the three districts had uh, different tools. We looked at things a little bit differently. And what we had to do is to come together and work to utilize the same type of tools, uh, look at the, same, the, the issues in the same type of manner, and then also have that a very open and transparent process. So the stakeholders, the utilities, DP, and the others could look at that and go, is that a, are, are we all in agreement in terms of what the science is saying so we can agree on the science? If you can't agree on the science, then it's very difficult to move forward to some of the solutions. We got that completed about uh, a couple of years ago. The second step is to develop the strategy. Once you know how much groundwater is available and you know what you need out in the future, then you start identifying, well, where do I get those other sources uh, other than groundwater in terms of meeting those needs? That's really uh, developed in two components. One is a regional water supply plan that we completed last year, draft was out for public review and that's part of that. The second component of number two is the solutions document that we just, uh, the steering committee just approved a couple of weeks ago. That's really what we're asking for y'all to review now is, is those regional uh, solutions uh, for the region. And really the difference between those, I'll touch base on the regional water supply plan, you can look at is, is, is what are those demands that we're gonna be out there in the next 20 years? What are the options that are available? Once we had that, then we took those options and worked through the solutions plan to look at those in more detail to make sure those were solutions there that are viable, that could be implemented as we go forward. So that's how those two documents are very much related. The third item that we still have work to do is in the establishing the consistent rules. Again, we know how much groundwater is available. We now have a regional water supply plan and our solutions document in terms of how we want to go forward. That's the draft that will be getting additional input over the next six months uh, from, from people like yourselves and others. Once we have that, then we need to uh, take what we've learned and, and look at our rules to see what rules do we need to modify so we have consistent rules uh, to provide the incentive and the framework so we can implement this strategy as we go forward. Next slide. The, again, the Regional Water Supply Plan looked at uh, 
what are, what are we using today, the 800 million gallons a day, what do we need in the next 20 years and by 2035, which is about 1.1 billion gallons a day, so about a 300 million gallon a day increase. And we looked and said, well, there's about an additional 50 million gallons of groundwater, so that takes us from 8 to 850. That means we need to come up with another 250 million gallons a day of options. Uh, the good news was that the Regional Water Supply Plan found that there was about 300, 350 million gallons a day of options. And what we found is, is out of those options, many of them were like the uh, reclaimed water lines that go out to a neighborhood that the local governments and utilities are implementing on their, on their, uh, on their own or with financial assistance. But those are uh, smaller scale projects, very important, and very, it's part of the solution. But we also recognize there was a large component of the projects to meet our needs out there. There were these larger projects, projects there that were going to require regional cooperation, regional collaborative efforts to be able to implement some of these capital intensive projects. Those are the ones there that we focused on in the solutions document that we'll cover a little bit. Again, this is going to be up to the regional water supply plan. Efforts will be updated every five years. What I can tell you is, is that uh, we'll know more information in five years and we may have to adapt as we go forward. Next slide. So the solutions discussion, what we thought we would do is, is not go through uh, every aspect of the, 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 the four documents that, that we have out there in terms of the, the summary and the appendices that are out there, but we, we thought we'd cover uh, several items, and not just me speaking, but also Steve and, and Joanne will cover uh, a couple of issues there that we've got identified. And before we go on, let's just pause there for a moment. <coughs> they gave you lots of information about the background and why we need to have a regional water supply plan. What questions might you have that they can answer before we dive into this recommended solution? Um, Please speak up to everybody here. Rick Baird, I'll go Kelly. Do the water management districts <coughs> currently have their own water supply plan? Does each water management district have their own supply plan in place? And does the CSWI, do they have a mechanism to implement this, um, everything we've heard today? It's a great, great question. Yes, each district has a, a regional water supply plan for the district. And what we're doing is the CFWI is a region uh, that crosses all three districts. And what we're doing is, is, as we update our regional water supply plans, we simply incorporate the CFWI document as part of our regional water supply plan. So if you look at our, our district's regional water supply plan and look at the, the area within, it's, within CFWI, you're going to see the same thing that's in the CFWI document. Uh, so it's very well coordinated. And then we follow those plans in terms of meeting our strategies. And I think the other districts are, are, are very similar. And, and the goal, Mark, was to get to a consistent regional water supply plan for this five-county area, knowing that it's got to coordinate with outside this region as well, correct? It, it is, and it's, it's the first time we've done a document that crossed the three district boundaries, and many people go, well, Mark, why didn't, you know, why, why weren't the districts formed? For this region instead of the way they, they were. Um, we were formed back back mostly in the 60s because of flooding. And that's what the, uh, the primary charge was at the day. And so they, they uh, formed us along the surface water boundaries. And then as we've grown in this area and relying on groundwater, now we're having to work across the boundaries. If back in the day we've been formed based on groundwater basins instead, we'd be forming alliances and working collaboratively to manage the surface water. So you've just got to take that into account that the groundwater basins and the surface water basins are slightly different and you've got to work across boundaries and that's what this effort does is help us to get consistent across the boundaries. Other regional water supply plan, you know, again, that list of some 150 options that were out there, looked at the demands, and uh, they reviewed all those options to see which ones of those were the more regional options. They worked to develop specific water supply options and focused a lot of attention on conservation. They also wanted to make sure there that we're protecting the resources out there, the wetlands, the, the, the lakes, 
that uh, we're required to, to manage. And so they uh, evaluated those options. And a key element of that was, was also identifying, do we need additional data out there? Do we have all the data and the information we need to make the very best decisions as we go forward? And look at what are the funding needs out there? It's, not, it's just not enough for us to go out there and say, well, you need to go implement these projects. We need to look at what is this going to cost and then work with the communities to figure out how are we going to implement those over time. Because these projects are not inexpensive uh, as we'll go through with that. So on the next slide. The key findings uh, were that water conservation is one of the critical pieces. It, it will, as you'll see it a little bit later, it's one of the, the least expensive alternatives. And so that's one of the key findings there that, that everybody recognized there is that uh, conservation is going to continue to be important. I think one of the things to make sure that we underscore, though, is, is this region has done a great job on conservation uh, in terms of all sectors, whether it's public supply or, or agriculture or the industrial users. They, uh, for the, you know, largely have implemented large-scale conservation efforts. There are still more opportunities there that we all recognize there that we need to utilize as we go forward. Good thing is, is there there is sufficient supplies out there to meet the region's needs well over you know, 150 options and more than 350 million gallons a day. So we do not have to go and implement all of the options. And if we can get more out of conservation than, than what the projections are, then again, we can, we can uh, save money, not build some of the more capital intensive type of projects. We also found that there are strategies that can be employed to address our environmental systems. We still have to now work to develop the projects to be able to implement those. Stakeholder, again, as, as Shelley has indicated, the stakeholder involvement is critical. We've got to stay engaged uh, with all of our stakeholders and have you at the table and working with us as we go forward. The cost estimates to implement projects, we, we took a look at several different scenarios. Again, not building all of the projects, but what are those likely projects? <coughs> and looked at several different scenarios to see would it, would it vary much in terms of the cost. It comes out around, depending on which scenarios you implement or which projects you implement to meet the water supply needs, it could be in the order of two, two and a half, three billion dollars to implement that. And Mark, can I yeah. stop right there? Because those two points together are really so important. Um, understanding building the stakeholder engagement has a direct connection on the cost. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it so important to stay together as we're looking at the costs associated with these projects going forward? What happens to collaboration when uh, you ask for money? <laughs> right? So unless we have a shared commitment to moving this forward, the, the risk is that the minute, and we studied collaborations on this issue of water across the country. When there are collaboratives, the, the number one thing that, that cracks them apart is when we start talking about money. So we don't want to talk about money now. What we want to talk about are the solutions and we agree to them so that we can then see the value of what the cost will be because there's a benefit to it as a reason. Make sense? All right. And I think to also to, to touch base on that is, is that keep in mind that the plan lays out these strategies. What's now important as we implement the plan, not to go out there and spend $2.8 billion at the drop of a hat, but we've got to stay engaged and look at that. And as we go forward over time, uh, identify which of those specific projects can we bring online that make the most sense uh, from the environmental perspective, from the economic perspective, and from the public that, that, that we're servicing out there. So. I think that's something there also is the plan give us a, gives us a roadmap, but we may change and, and go on different roads as we move forward, uh, still consistent with that plan, and then adapt that as we go forward. Again, the consistent rules and regulations is a key piece of it, and I think also the last one there is, is, is again, it's not just a, a plan that we put on the shelf and think, okay, well, we've solved the problem. This is something there that we've got to continue to monitor and work with the stakeholders as we go forward over time and then make adjustments as we need to. So the next slide. Really the, the uh, eight strategies that we've identified, and we were really going to focus on the, the three that are, the top three that are shown in green there, 
uh, spend a little bit more time. Uh, Steve's going to talk about uh, water conservation, and Joanne's going to talk about some of the prevention and recovery uh, projects on there, and then I'll talk some about the, the actual regional projects and give you a flavor on that. The reason why we picked these three to, to talk about, these are some of the three areas there that we've gotten a lot of uh, feedback on, that we've heard from the community out there, and really the way it's characterized is, is, is there's concerns out there that we're not doing enough on conservation. Uh, on the recovery and prevention, there's also concern, are we doing enough to protect and restore our systems out there that have been affected? And then on the third one, in terms of the projects, concern that we're still relying some on groundwater and we're in concern over developing surface water supplies. So those are three common issues that we've, that we've heard over the last year. And so we want to focus a little bit of time as we go forward on that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve that can uh, talk to you, with you a little bit more detail about conservation. And just again, so uh, to talk about process, we're going to go through all three areas and then open it up for <coughs> conversation about all three. What we learned on Monday is there's so much overlap between the three areas.